Uh, Charlie, you can take it away. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Tatiana Karpi. Uh, Tatiana, please tell us about your living history. Well, thank you very much, um, Sri and Charlie, for the introductions and for the opportunity to have this discussion. And this, I think it's very innovative format. So um, my, I was going to tell you about my curved trajectories from physics to neuroscience and um, where I am right now in San Diego at the Salk Institute. So I grew up in the Ukraine. This is uh, me with my mother. Um, um, on the central part in um, in Kiev, when it was uh, Soviet times, you can see the the emblem right here. And I'm wearing a hat from Central Asia because uh, my grandfather had some students from Central Asia, from Kazakhstan, and then they uh, that's how I interacted a lot with people from Kazakhstan. So that's me playing piano, and during winter, you know, it's, 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 it can be cold in Ukraine. So we had boots and everything. And then, um, so, and that's a skiing vacation at um, at the resort. I'm pictured next to resort where I was staying. We can see it offers authentic rustic experience, complete with an hour and a half walk to the slopes. But you can see one can be very happy with minimal, um, minimal things. So then I studied physics. I had a choice between physics and mathematics. I didn't know anything about biology, but my passion was um, and still lies with physics. So that's me and um, some friends at an auditorium studying uh, physics at university in Kiev. And that's um, our building that was um, um, a group in theoretical physics. That was my dream and still is. And that's our graduating class of um, a physicist in Ukraine. So from there, I went to pursue PhD in theoretical physics at Michigan State. And I was fascinated by this article. I, I studied condensed matter, solid state physics, but I was fascinated by this article, um, um, famous article by Nobel Prize uh, winning uh, physicist, Philip Anderson about more is different. And he says that there are in any new level of organization, you need new theories. So you cannot derive how um, a solid will behave by, from knowing how electrons behave and so on. And he goes all the way. And that's foreshadowing things. He even talks about how you need new theories to understand neuroscience and psychology. Uh, even if you that doesn't exactly follow from um, single neurons. So after my PhD in theoretical physics, it was very um, fundamental physics a PhD. I was interested in tunneling and the theory of how particles tunnel in the magnetic field turns out, even though it's a fundamental property, uh, there was no solution. And after that, I was thinking um, brain computation or um, actually it shouldn't be supercomputers, it should be a quantum computer. So this is where my two choices. And in an alternative universe, there is somewhere there is Tanya Sharpie that is um, studying quantum computers, but I, I decided to go with the brain, primarily because um, uh, brain exists. So, you know, at least this click, when you're solving a problem, um, you know, at least it's helpful to know that the solution exists versus in the quantum computer, we don't know if it exists or doesn't exist. So then brain versus supercomputer, I um, to study the brain. I uh, At the time they had a program and uh, I went to UCSF to do a postdoc in computational neuroscience. And it was really a special place because there was a cohort. We talked about the peer group. So there was a Every year, there would be a new group of um, um, two, three uh, physics PhDs who don't know anything about neuroscience, but have quantitative skills, and they were um, groomed or immersed in the neuroscience environment. And uh, we were um, helping each other out to attend classes in neuroscience and learn more about neuroscience. So after um, that, uh, extended what could be 
thought of a second PhD in neuroscience, I went to San Diego, the Salk Institute. This is, and um, my passion in neuroscience was to understand what happens in the brain. At the time, we were studying the brain with very simplified stimuli. And I wanted to know what happens in the brain when you're watching a movie. So it turns out that in the brain, there is a series of transformations. So this is a flattened picture of the brain. And early parts respond to simple pictures like edges or um, TV fuzz. And then the later things do not. So my goal as a theorist was to develop statistical method that can take a life full of structure, natural scene, and help figure out what's happening as a result of this um, process. And we're still working. We haven't solved that problem, so we're still working on it. And in parallel, because I was interested in natural scenes, I also became interested in uh, smells. And because one could think natural um, stimul na photographs or music or sound, well, what about smell? And it turns out smell is, um, is, is a fascinating sense um, in, in many respects. And uh, one of them is that it's impossible, well, not impossible, but not intuitive for how to define distances between molecules. And it's a fascinating uh, paper uh, by Cell. He spent um, 30 years in the perfume industry and basically concluded in 2006 that olfaction isn't going to be um, solved anytime soon. And the reason is that you can have these pairs of molecules such as this one that are identical, have identical chemical structure, but just different chirality. And they will spell, uh, smell differently. One will be spearmint and the other one is caraway. And there are also these triplets of molecules, such as one of them is here, where, um, you will have very similar structure, but smell differently, or very rather different structures, but smell the same. And sometimes it's good not to know, this is what um, I was told by other scientists, sometimes it's good to be a newcomer to the field and not know that something is difficult, then you just, just go for it. And um, turns out that there is logic to this complexity. And the complexity is that it's not that the chemical structure that matters. What matters is what do these molecules represent in a plant? Um, when I smell something, I'm not that interested in the chemical structure. I'm interested in it as a communication, what's happening inside the plant. So in this particular plant, um, uh, you might, some of you who know chemist, chemistry well, might recognize that this is um, cyanide. So that's poisonous. And so the plant can't store this, but it's activated by some pathway. And uh, when I smell something, that is an indication that that pathway got indicated. So we use this measure of distances um, between molecules, who goes with what. And using these principles, you can define surface, um, you can define distances between any kinds of parameters. So um, in our case, between molecules. And we try to find what is the map that describes smells. And it turns out you can get this map and based on these distances. So whoever is, goes up and down together will be assigned smaller distances. And then once you have these distances, you can put them on different mannequins. And generally, there are only three types of mannequins you can have. You can have a spherical surface, you can have a flat surface, and you can have a negative curvature or hyperbolic surface. So it turns out that our um, strawberry data that from food industry uh, fell not on a spherical surface and not on a flat surface, but on a hyperbolic surface. And there are many fascinating properties about these hyperbolic spaces. And we have been... Um, Mm. Uh, working um, on these spaces ever since uh, we discovered this and um, I'll just skip in data, but I'll just show you a hyperbolic map. So it is designed as a um, map over a tree that is hidden 
So what you see are the molecules that are produced by pathways that are hidden to you. But based on these dis distances between leaves, you can figure out what is the complexity of the hidden tree underneath. And so this is the map of odorants on this um, um, hyperbolic representation that looks like a sphere, it's a concave sphere. And uh, we can put more molecules on it. And now we can kind of have a coordinates for smell. So next time you order wine, our hope is to say that you can say, my favorite wine has coordinates 5.7, 2.3, 4.5, and, and so on. So that's um, one of the goals. And I'm still um, thinking about, um, and actually, so how much time do I have? Zero or minus one? Anyway, so I'm gonna... Um, okay. Okay, so I'm just gonna tell you that this is not, these trees are not just for smells, but I believe they're everywhere. It, they describe natural scenes, natural sounds, and neural responses in the brain. And actually, we, recently we discovered that these neural responses in the brain also can be put on the hyperbolic surface. And the information that you absorb makes that space grow. And it grows um, with time in a very efficient and maximally informative way, but it's primarily experience um, and time that drives the space. So we say, when you learn something, take your time. And um, that's because it's the time that is necessary to allow the growth of these hyperbolic representations and how they get more and more detail. So um, this is just a highlight. This is a hello from my group um, from before pandemic and, uh, and the more recent um, update. So this is um, what I prepared and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Tatiana, for a fantastic talk. And I'm applauding on behalf of the audience. Uh, so I'll start out with the with one, first question. Uh, so does the fact that hyperbolic space is not compact imply that the complexity of strawberry smells is infinite? Well, so um, it turns out that you can estimate the radius of hyperbolic space for different data sets. And for a strawberry, it was like, seven steps, so you can say seven hierarchical steps. And we found that the same complexity in a, originally applies to all kinds of different data set, blueberries, strawberries, mouse urine, and, and so on. So, but these are all kind of, you know, similar types of plants. But now with neural responses, this is not limited. And so there it um, kind of grows. And um, I, I'm still, um, I was fascinated. The reason I, I, I wanted, um, it's accidental how I stumbled on hyperbolic geometry, but I'm very much fascinated between the mathematical match between the structure of our universe, which is also hyperbolic, and the structure of um, our nervous system in the brain that is hyperbolic. And, uh, you know, some of us, uh, when I attend recent um, physics colloquia, what I'm learning is that, um, according to some views, we live inside a black hole. So our expanding universe is really from the out. You know, if you could be outside, it would look like a gr growing black hole. And so the information falls in, and the space grows. So. Um, in our case, you learn something and your representation grows. <laughs> anyway, this is the, um, this is some intuition outside of what can be published. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so a follow-up question from the, the audience. Um, so this is fascinating, but here's a naive question. Do these maps apply to all people, even if they have different olfactory sensitivities? So um, now imagine that you have people who are connoisseurs in wine. And so for them, the space will be, the sphere will be larger and they can discriminate more things. And actually, um, you know, everything new is a well forgotten old. So there are studies of human visual perception um, 
from 1947 and so on, where they map that the human visual perception is hyperbolic. So in effect, when you think about it, our visual perception is like a dome. And actually little kids reach out for the moon because the moon is closer to us than it should be. So perceptually it is closer. So people who have higher acuity, you can measure for them the size of this hyperbolic dome. And people with higher acu visual acuity will have a larger kind of a radius. So, um, and in fact, one could maybe characterize this um, you know, for people, but in vision, but also in olfaction. And of course, the, the space doesn't have to be uniform. So it's more like a broccoli. So you can say that when you learn about something and you become an expert in some area, that part of the hyperbolic space becomes larger and, and kind of expands. Um, maybe, so for example, when, and it's all about hierarchical structures. When I was switching from physics to neuroscience, I had all these papers in, on condensed matter physics. And I had one tiny, tiny paper folder with labeled neurons. <laughs> and then this neuron folder kept growing and growing and eventually was, uh, was uh, disappeared into electronic archives. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, one more question. Um, so you, you spoke about you know, switching over into neuroscience at, at that point in your, your career in your postdoc. Um, can you talk about some of the the challenges that you faced and moving into something that required you to learn so much that was new? I think that was very challenging. And um, I, I think that in some people tell me that in neuroscience, I have an accent, that my native language is physics. And so, you know, when I speak to physicists, it, it comes easier across because um, you know, just like in a in a foreign language. So it, it's like becoming an immigrant in a different, because in physics, I knew that uh, I had solid education. I knew that I knew everything I was supposed to know. So, but in neuroscience, it's all new. And uh, uh, this lack of maybe confidence, whether I learned everything that I was supposed to know for this part of um, presentation, was was hard. Thank you, thank you. Um, and uh, thank you again for a fascinating talk.